Atlas, which is this space. It's a new kind of art architecture experimental movement space that we opened last April. Um, and kind of the mission of it is where various disciplines kind of uh, speak to or even against each other as they uh, kind of navigate or narrate their, or what's a better word, more articulate word, I can't think of right now, their own terms and histories. Quickly, uh, this is a show that we co-curated with Michael and uh, Matt Rappaport, who's around. It was, the inspiration came from John and Alana's book, and they were doing a um, show with uh, January at the MCA, and we just thought, it, Michael came to us, and we thought it was interesting to try to give more, we read the book, we liked the project, we liked all the, the proposals, and we wanted to give more space to it and uh, kind of put it into a different environment and see how it could work within both environments. And part of uh, the, the piece that Matt and I did is we took Matt's piece, Range, and we used that as a kind of transportation of ideas and or people uh, from one institution, let's say January's institution, to another. And you know, what happens when information goes from essentially across a border um, or from one venue to another? So with that, uh, part of being a little bit of an experimental space is we can make you very un uncomfortably cold. So since we chose October, late October is the ideal month to have the door open for a, a kind of an eccentric docking sequence, I have turned the heat off for the length <laughs> of the talk because it is going to drown out the voices. So just hunker down. If you get really cold, we'll take a break and I'll blast it, the heat. But if not, it's off. We will turn it on when it's done. So I just want to apologize for that. And Michael? Thanks to both of you uh, for allowing and helping this program come together. I, I can't imagine another space in the city at this point that would be open to sort of taking on risky ideas like we've been playing with. And so I, I love the, the interplay of the different disciplines and the willingness to cross those borders or boundaries um, and see what comes out of it. So I, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know or haven't um, encountered this talk series before, it's uh, called Movement Matters, and it's a program that's been running for a few years now, and every season we have you know, one or three talks on various topics. Um, and Movement Matters is a program that sort of looks at uh, performance, dance, social movements, other types of ideas around what movement is, and um, which we've been you know, very intentionally collecting documentary footage for uh, that eventually will become part of a doc series that looks at this moment in Chicago over the last so many years and the ideas that are driving a lot of the practices. So uh, it's, it's, it's always a great honor and a privilege to uh, share a table and to discuss all the ideas from uh, all the various perspectives um, and so what I, I think we'll do is sort of formally just walk through um, an introduction and then I really conceive of this as a conversation, an opportunity to sort of get our heads around the topic uh, together. And I've got some questions, but I like the idea of all of this sort of being visibly, <laughs> uh, visible and working through these questions on the spot, as it were. Um, I think that's more interesting than sort of... Yeah, I'll give you the line. We're supposed to have the train schedule. Oh yeah, right. So, but there is, yeah. that is the train wall, so. Yeah, it runs right along that wall. It's it just is, yeah. yeah. It movement matters, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's infrastructure for it too, yeah. yeah. Um, so, just by way of, for those who may be watching and who don't know all these folks, I'll start with uh, John Bertle, who is the editor of Propositional Attitudes, co-editor of Propositional Attitudes, yeah, that's right, um, with Alana. Uh, both artists from LA who flew out here uh, for this program, uh, we're part of the MCA program as well, and um, Lane Hall, who is here's your title, professor of creative writing, media, cinema, and digital studies at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Milwaukee, and co-founder of the Overpass Light Brigade, and Lisa Moline, associate professor of design and visual communication, at the University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and also co-founder of the Overpass Light Brigade, uh, and also we have the privilege of January Parkus Arnal, who is the curator of the Commons at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. So welcome to all of you. Thanks for coming. And I just want to sort of start with uh, what I think is the question right now, which is uh, 
which I think you'll each have a sort of unique perspective on, which is what role the public plays spe specific to each of your practices and how you would define that role. I think, John, can we just start with you and sort of, obviously uh, your instructional work is an engagement and. Um, I mean, I think about public in a lot of different ways. Yeah, all right. Like, uh, yeah, so like um, with the scores in the book, we intentionally really wanted to make something that anybody could really pick up that didn't have specific training. And, At any time, right? Yeah, yeah. and really um, perform these works. So in that way, like the public was really broad. Um, mm -hmm. And like a book is really, uh, works well for that, right? Like you can circulate very easily, go in lots of different types of spaces. Right. Um, maybe places that people that might not come to an event at a experimental art space. Right. You can kind of find people that way. So I think like with this work, that's a lot of how we think about public. Mm -hmm. Well, I would, just, would you say from our perspective, it wasn't meant to sort of reach outside of the art context? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's a small run book. That's sort of we only made 250 of them. Um, by this small experimental right. press in LA um, that right. <laughs> basically is accessible through other um, artists and like art book lovers. Um, yeah. So in that way, you know, the audience is just like limited. You can't you can't buy it. You can't go to Amazon and just like buy the book. Um, but uh, yeah, but um, it is able to you can you can go online and buy it um and you know it kind of crosses a bunch of different disciplines um so you know writing dance art poetry music um and it has contributors from all of those um various disciplines too right. um i mean we love the idea that anybody you know, like Flux's scores, there is this idea of just like, yeah, let's break down these barriers. Like one of John's scores that has been talked about a lot is like, yeah. get bored. Right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Two line, get bored. Right. Yeah. Well, um, there's a certain interest. I, I just not about. in the show. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, actually, we, we love the idea that anybody could perform that during any of our events. Right. You know? <laughs> 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 Anytime. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah, and actually the idea for the book came out of um, uh, us thinking about writing scores for our like lecture, our artist talks, um, and for um, artist talks that we were attending. So John has this great score that's like called a look or something, and so he was like in a lecture, but it could be any lecture, you know, it could be you know, um, a politician or a yeah. scholar or whatever. Um, so it is like kind of a pedagogical space, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it's like all about the looks that people give to each other within those spaces, like a dirty look, like a, right. a slimy yeah. look, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so we're thinking about like activating the audience. You know, it's interesting to me too, because I think of the scores and the collection of scores as itself a public, which was, Unconnected in many ways, all the different people writing these scores, yeah. who may have just never been seen or read or performed at all. Yeah, prior, yeah prior and to a it. lot of the people we didn't know. I mean, we did a phone call, so right. we really got to like. Really so it started with an engagement with yeah. the public, yeah. Uh, January, what's your take on that? I mean, we talk a lot about public yeah. engagement and the role of the commons, which. No, and I think I probably have a very different perspective on this yeah. than. Um, Fellows, fellow colleagues up here, since I'm coming at it from the perspective of a curator. And uh, I think a lot about the public in sort of plural, the multiple publics right. that we serve yeah. as an institution, that I serve as uh, a curator who works in a public program. So, you know, I think about the public that's coming through our doors that has no idea what they're expecting, and right. the public that we never see at the museum and how we can know what that public needs and wants from us. The public of 
the artists that we try to give some kind of a platform to and then how those different publics interact on sort of the grounds of the museum and how we give them the tools to interact. So the way that those publics can kind of come together through the tools that we provide in the space by working with artists. So this was a really exciting project for us to be a part of because it's all about giving tools to these various publics that all come together at the site of a museum that happens to be downtown next to many hotels. So we've got right. a lot of tourists who <laughs> yeah, exactly. come in and they're like, oh, I don't like contemporary art. What is this? <laughs> like, it's the Museum of Contemporary right. Art. <laughs> So, so you know, you know yeah. so it's a very interesting public that we get to interact with, and this was an interesting project because it was all about mm. sort of the way publics can kind of come together through different tools. Yeah, I mean, I think you know, it's interesting to me. I don't think ten years ago the museum may have necessarily taken this on because uh, the, the idea of having an outside space as a presenting partner at that time just never would have materialized. And so the Commons is a very unique mm -hmm. space to that. Which I, which is what drew me to it, because now it's it's about you know the museum having holding a space for those various publics as opposed to it being an institution that's resistant to um, resist, resist in some sense that it's it's distance itself from it. So I think this is it's, there's something exciting about that to me. But there, you know, we've also talked about the sort of differences in social engagement. Um, and do you think that that's prohibitive or helpful in terms of how, what the vision of the commons is? When you say the difference in social engagement, yeah, I think like, like, like history, social yeah. practice, yeah. as opposed well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I mean, I intentionally, yeah. I tend to call my work more public engagement right. or socially um, oriented or public practice mm -hmm. as opposed to socially engaged art, which really has a long history and I think right. maybe you guys can speak a little bit to Absolutely. this, and I know that these two have done some of that kind of deep community work as well. As a museum, we can't necessarily do that kind of work. And so we really think about the artists that we bring in for these four to five month long projects uh, within the common space, as well as the artists that we bring in for an evening to try out some new works. We think of it as more engaging our public, because we're not gonna be able to dive deeply into a community within Chicago as a museum. That's just, right. you know, we can't do it without being disingenuous to that public. Um, yes. So I'm very against that kind of plop programming where museums just go into a community within Chicago and it's like, here, we're gonna yeah. do stuff with you for a minute and then hmm. come back to us if you want more. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. So we try not to do that, but really to deeply engage the various publics that are coming into the museum and try to offer as many resources as we can to our partners across the city. Um, but recognizing that our partners across the city are doing such culturally rich work already that we don't need to go in you know, and say like, oh, like let me take groups. over your yeah. space. Right. Rather we can say, how can we partner and learn from your practice as well as you know, give you some resources that we might hold being where we are with the public that we have. So, yeah, but I'm eager to hear more about what the socially engaged sort of side of the artist practice Yeah, so Lainley, so this is something obviously that resonates in terms of holding public space um, and the definition of it in terms of um, the work you've done with Overpass. Yeah, let, let uh, I, and I want to say I think this is a pretty enlightened uh, point of view institutionally because it acknowledges the rich culture in Chicago, the rich histories of collectives and cooperatives mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, as well as like we're, we're from Milwaukee and there's just a rich kind of grassroots culture that still exists there. So first I want to kind of describe or explain a little what we do, if that's yeah. okay. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's right. Because um, I think kind of the history of it makes it, you know, helps it make sense and then <laughs> you know, talk after after that. The the um, so in in 2010 with the uh, right wing legislative uh, coup that happened in Wisconsin under Scott Walker, yeah. uh, uh, Lisa and I were working a lot on uh, as we, before we been artists doing installations and, and print based and, and, and installation based work. 
what we really got, we, we really felt the urgency to go out and kind of take it to the streets. So uh, in, in, a, in a series of just, you know, really kind of phenomenally, uh, just sort of pragmatic decisions of, of like, how do we get uh, nighttime visibility because we're trying to get um, uh, signatures and realize that most people were out and about in late November in uh, kind of like at rush hour. So it's like, okay, let's let's go out on the overpasses, but well, we won't be seen because it's dark. Okay, well, let's. What about what about lights? And at and at first we were thinking we would make signs and banners and do banner drops and like get down below and shine. Uh, spotlights on, and then we at, at the convergent with that was just new products of LED lights that are battery packed, super simple. So we uh, uh, just did this um, kind of DIY creation of how to make big, light, lightweight, mobile lighted letters. So it's essentially like a whole series of lighted letters that are about two foot by three foot, fit in the back of our Subaru. Very pragmatic. Yeah. Um, that's kind of like having a series of refrigerator magnets where you say, I've got these, this, uh, not just the alphabet, but these uh, you know, letters and numbers, what can we spell? So at first it was like recall walker and stuff like that. When that, um, uh, when that effort failed, it coincided with the breakup of Occupy and we were getting a lot of queries from people, you know, oh, you know, we need something like that to bring our communities together. How do we do this? So we open sourced it, uh, inspired by the Graffiti Research Lab. Okay. You know, their beautiful work. And so we open sourced it and started to say, look, if you all want to do this, that's great. Here's how to do it. You can just do it. But if you want to be a light brigade, because we were the overpass light brigade, then like take your region and, 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 and do your thing and then name it your, you know, like Portland Life Brigade or San Diego Life Brigade or New York City Life yeah. Brigade. And that rapidly spread. So we now have 50 chapters uh, of light brigades and different brigades uh, uh, around the world. So to, to end, you know, that, that, that gives a sense of what we do kind of like, like you know, frankly, leftist propaganda out in public spaces at night. Yeah. Uh, lately, we've been trying to do more poetic uh, uh, things, but, but that's what we do. So, um, the publics are complex, and I love the question, because it's public space, it's often contested. We have a lot of interactions with, with, with law enforcement and people who don't like us being out there. Uh, we have what we what we call the holders of the lights, using the kind of ready-made metaphors of what we do. You know, you know, we're on bridges, so we like you know bridge the divides and hold the holders of lights and all this stuff. So they come out. We have this community of volunteers. Then all the people that see it firsthand, that's a public, and then all the remediation in social media because we're very aggressive about uh, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and. Uh, you know, highly tagged things on on Flickr. We do a lot on Vimeo. So, like, if you want to Google Overpass Light Brigade with an image search on, you'll just see like pages and pages and pages. Yeah. Where do you no, want to go? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I have much to add to that. Um, <coughs> other other than that, um, the, this project wouldn't exist without the public, and and it it needs the public to perform it. It needs the public to see it, whether it's live and, and unexpected or uh, something that pops up in social media. And, and we um, you know, absolutely need the public space to do it. So, so everything about it has been um, negotiating different kinds of publics and communities and community building and, and um, you know, that, that, that kind, of, kind of network of allies um, of people who are, are engaged in this, in, similar and, and symbiotic um, activities, some of which are highly political, others of which are more um, you know, kind of contemplative, yet, yet still are, are political in their intention, just not partisan political or electoral political. So you know, we do kind of you know, balance the sort of philosophical, <coughs> we have, we have a, a large body of work that focuses on water and um, you know, living on you know, Lake Michigan, um, which is a, a very contested, you know, chunk of fresh water that, that a, a lot of entities would like to start sticking their hoses in and suck up. Um, we have a lot of natural allies who are, are interested in, in preserving the water um, and, and a 
lot of that is, is you know, advocacy at the, at the, the level of public utilities, um, advocacy from environmentalists, and, and advocacy from uh, Native communities who uh, have a really vested interest in the sacred nature of water. So, so that's, been, that's been kind of a lovely hub for um, engaging many different publics about an incredibly important issue. Yeah, you know, one of the questions that occurs to me in terms of this um, uh, reclamation, you know, Occupy was about this too, it was about inhabiting space mm -hmm. that was public space, that um, there was opposition to them inhabiting as the public. <laughs> yeah, just, just to you know, put it simply. But I think that's, in, that's also interesting to me about that notion of space is um, the differences geographically. And I, you know, Alana and I have talked a lot about um, the difference between, for instance, LA and Chicago, where there's perhaps different um, we, we talk a lot about the Fluxus Archive, but, so that's a question to, to put out there coming from these different perspectives is what role ge geography may play in holding um, what you all do, because I'm sure that certain brigades are formed that might have different challenges. Yeah, um, yeah that, I mean, that, that's a, a critical question. So, and even in inhabiting, uh, uh, even the, the idea of space, you know, what, what are we talking about? Mm -hmm social media space, is it private, is it public, is it a place where we organize, is it a place where we, where we disseminate? Um, so, you know, for instance, uh, I mean, Milwaukee's really cool because uh, I mean, at first, every night we went out, we would get rousted by the police, and, you know, you, and so we, we found we developed all kinds of protocols on dealing with law enforcement and doing it in a civil and, and um, you know, in, in a way because we didn't want that to be our issue. We wanted our issue to be our issue, right? <coughs> so, so, so there was that, and yet uh, the, uh, a light brigade that formed in Austin had very militarized police, and they were like, you can't be out here because, you know, like these could fall on, on, the, on the street below. So they very cleverly made big uh, 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 you know, necklaces. Oh, yeah. Giant necklaces. So, so it was more like a wearable, and yeah. then the police would come out and say, you can't be out here because it's driver distraction. And then they would say, but look at this flashing you know, neon billboard over here. And so there was this whole kinds of things that, that, that they went through. And, and then the locality, uh, it's, it's been really interesting organizing what we think of as this loose confederation of, 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 of activists. So like in San Diego Light Brigade is really active and they do a lot with border issues right at the border. And it's like when they do stuff, I'm so excited because it's just always cool. And the New York City Light Brigade is really active because they do all kinds of stuff in front of Trump Tower and in marches. And, and, yeah. and, and, and they're, uh, they've developed certain kinds of tactical things because a lot of a lot of the transport is um, yeah. public transport, so they, so they can't just it. like lug you know thirty five pretty big letters around. They 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 are much more kind of rapid response and smaller and and I mean basically they're plug and play. It's it's really exciting because That's, something happens, they make something, they're out. And then and then just to to, to um, uh, uh, you know finish that up. The there there have been some. Other light brigades that it's just so, you know, like they, they come and they go, you know, and that's okay as well. Like all these things have a life and that, you know, so you have to have a certain kind of, of, of sort of worldliness to it. It's like people start and, you know, some of them are still active, some of them aren't. Mm -hmm. and, and I think all that's, you know, pretty cool. Yeah. I, I think, I think the, the kind of most surprising and delightful thing that we discovered was, was after the um, Charlie Hebdo massacre in Paris, all of a sudden there was a Paris Light Brigade and they showed up and they, they had the lights and you know it was it was just it was just beautiful and, and you know there's everybody in, you know out in the public crowds of, of hundreds of thousands and then there are the lights. But but what I discovered from um, getting to know them a little and, and learning about where they came from is they'd adopted the lights to do a series of videos about night trains. And they, they wanted night trains back. So there were some trains that had been taken off. And so they, they had a really local political issue. They made the signs that it's work. We never saw it. We knew nothing about it. And then all of a sudden, they were ready to go when, when there was something that was getting um, international attention. <coughs> and, and it, 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 I mean, they, 
Yeah, they're still active. But they are, and they're, and they're not afraid, and the yeah. uh, Square Republique uh, became like the iconic image from, mm -hmm. from that. It was like the AP image. But, uh, so. You know, I, you, uh, you're probably really well equipped to answer this question to a certain degree, too, because coming from LA and now in Chicago, sort of learning the environment, I guess. Well, I think also when you, when you brought that up and also hearing some of what the experiences that, that you all have had in these different places, I think not only of geography, and mm -hmm. you said loitering, but just thinking, especially in LA, mm -hmm. the privilege that comes along with loitering Absolutely. and occupying space, mm -hmm. you know, even like the score of being bored. Who's allowed to just be bored and be still yeah. in public space? Mm -hmm. Who's allowed to kind of act out these sort of gestures and movements in public space and how mm -hmm. our bodies are sort of policed based on a variety of different superficial aspects um, of our identity. Movement is exclusion too, yeah. Yeah, and so that definitely comes up for me. Yeah, no, it was something that John and I talked about a lot actually when we were editing the book um, because we <coughs> talk about like, you know, what we were like, oh, we, let's write some scores um, related to this issue, or related to that issue, or we even got submissions of scores and we were like, who could perform that score? Like comfortably in public space. Mm -hmm. um, you and mean, whether in terms of them being overtly <coughs> political in some sense, or yeah, or like engaging with <coughs> like police or oh, right, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, we were just that just came up um, a lot uh, for us too um, uh, in terms of like you know what bodies are privileged to perform mm -hmm. these kind of scores. Yeah, in LA, there's I mean. Santa Monica and Westwood, there's all of these loitering laws mm -hmm. that, you know, essentially are only ever enforced if you look homeless. Uh -huh. So right. when uh, I was at the Hammer Museum prior to coming to the MCA, and when we became a free museum <laughs> to all of uh, the public, it was a donor-sponsored uh, opening of the museum, we started to get Quite a few of our local um, uh, population of folks who are houseless, mm -hmm. um, who would come to the museum. It was a safe place to be. It was warm. You know, could look at art and go um, to the bathroom. You know, it provided resources, Absolutely. and we had to talk about that internally. How do we deal with people who don't look like our members might want to, like the, people, right. the community that our members and our visitors might assume and want to be around and that we needed to open ourselves up to that. And you know, the comfort of our regular visitors couldn't take precedence over the care we were giving to our local community by pri providing an open public space. But it's a tough, it's a tough question, and it's definitely something in LA. I don't know. I would love to know if that's really something that you all feel in Chicago as well. Those sort of loitering laws. Well, that, certainly the uptown neighborhood has had a long struggle with the alderman Kappelman there, who has actively and successfully displaced uh, Tent City. Um, so that happens across the mm -hmm. the city of uptown, in particular, has a long history of um, uh, mental health centers that were closed down. And the population, and so that's been for decades. Now that area has been contested on those lines. And all those lines. So, yeah, Chicago certainly has those problems um, in many other ways. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it, all this sort of goes to this question for me too. And I, I ask this, I think, probably in every panel. It's like, to what degree is art able to help people confront their own? value systems and norms, and is it a vehicle for engagement on that level? And I, you know, I, I'm, I'm convinced that it can, <laughs> but you know, I, or, I, or you wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here, I believe in it, you know, but I, I think it's repeatedly worth asking because the challenge is that art as, you know, having that kind of relevance, um, uh, are, there's, they're, they're rooted in the, the changes in the social environment and 
So that's a, to put that out there too. It's like you know what, what to what degree can it successfully? I did a project this? with Michael Rackwitz oh, yeah. um, uh, in fall of last year. We did uh, so there was an exhibition at the museum that I didn't organize, but mm. I organized um, a uh, viewing of his or a re. Yeah. Configuring of his enemy kitchen project right. in which he brought together and this is a project from the 90s where he brought together uh, veterans of the Iraq war with uh, Iraqi refugees who were in Chicago um, And they made food based on his mother's recipes uh, his, his mother was from Iraq and he made this incredible Iraqi food and then had the veterans serve the food the public and it was incredible the responses so we did this in the plaza outside of the museum and provided the food for free um, so we had a huge mix of people from our neighbors who are you know Lurie Children's Hospital and nurses and doctors and hospital administrators and you know the just folks walking around who are tourists who have nothing no idea about contemporary art the conversations to just randomly um, immigrants to this country who recognized in the story of the Iraqi refugees that were serving and preparing the food, they recognized their own stories and how those would come together to other veterans of, um, of war and yeah. you know, to, in right. different countries. And, sharing their experience. I mean, the stories were just incredible, and that came through an art project, but it brought people together in ways that I thought were totally unexpected. Food also does that yeah, in right. a way, I yeah. think. I love free food. food. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> free food especially, it lowers people's inhibitions. Yeah. Because you know, the, the project was Conflict Kitchen out mm -hmm. of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. It right. makes me so, think of that, yeah, that kind exactly. of brilliant sort of pop-up food stand that, that, that will focus on different uh, food from countries that we've been at war with chronically, uh, and which I think is the same kind of beautiful yeah. idea. Yeah, really, really but I love stuff like that, and and you know, it's it's an interesting question. Uh, you know, like back back to Occupy, I just want to yeah. suggest that there's really interesting histories of bodies in space and occupation, and you know, w we could go all the way back to like the Paris Commune mm -hmm. taking over the city and the barricades and. Gustave Courbet and his, his, you know, his, his relationship with that. But I think even for us, even more deeply to indigenous resistance, starting with Alcatraz and then moving to Wounded Knee and then just taking that right through to Standing Rock and then looking at the Occupy movement as a kind of tactical uh, ad you know, uh, ad adaptation and adoption of that. With, with, with the question of like, advocacy and activism and art, in, in some ways I, I like to think, I like to separate that out between aspiration and efficacy, mm -hmm. because in some ways the efficacy question is the hardest, because we'll often get, it's like, oh, how do you know, you know, you're just preaching to the converted or talking to the choir or like people don't care or whatever, and, and it's kind of like, you know, I don't even care about that anymore. I, I think the engagement for me is what matters and for our communities. The aspirational aspect is what are we trying to do and are we honest when we actually assess that what we say we're trying to do is actually what we're doing? And that's a feedback loop that really interests me. And to yeah. me, that critical feedback loop is much more interesting than the, than the aesthetic frame of is it art or is it not or is it good art or, or you know, is it recognized in the art world? To me, those are like really dead questions but these other questions are still very alive, at least in, in, in our lives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, I think what's really um, effective and also savvy about your project is that um, it is this, this project that um, can happen very quickly and it can, like it has this framework, but that it can kind of move quickly, you know, within that. And I think that's, I worked with um, activists it's always like this thing of I work slowly you know I'm an artist like I have like a different um, time frame yeah. you know and activists 
are like always on the move. You know, it's always just like they're responding to like what's happening like in the moment. You know, and so um, it's been this like I just um, did this poster project with a um, like feminist activist group that works mostly in Japan, and um, you know we were creating this poster together, and it was like months of just like well, I don't know if we're going to do it. Or like, okay, well, I think we are, but we're not sure what it's going to be about. And like, it was just kind of like this back, like just this process. Um, and, and like when I have worked um, like in more activist ways, it's had to be this very kind of quick, these quick, faster gestures, you know, um, rather than like, I'm going to take a year to conceive of this, um, this thing. And so, so that's, Something that's so great about your project is that um, that it, you know it has this like really um, simple. Although I'm, it's not simple. I mean, you guys have spent you spent a lot of time kind of like coming up with it, making, developing it, you know, yeah, making it. it um, but then it, it can be transformed and and just sort of like you know um, move through space in this very rapid way. So I just wanted to say briefly: a, we have an overpass. <laughs> we do have so when Michael that. and Matt's like, well, the overpass light brigade, I'm like, light brigade, like the charge of the light brigade, mm -hmm. the poem, I was like, well, that was a slaughter. Yeah. I didn't even know if that was intentional, but I love the fact that maybe that's a reference. But then I was like, well, we have an overpass, and they're like, oh, yeah. But as an architect, that's what we do. We do circulation. Yeah. People think we do, yes. you know, we do health, safety, welfare, but that's, that's the municipal part of it. We really do program. Program's really circulation. That's all we really do, whether it's a home or not. And what attracted us to this space was uh, also there was a service road to the highway. Mm -hmm. You go down that road, there's an accident site. Mm -hmm. There's an overpass. Mm -hmm. This has become a cut through. There's a train line. Uh, we really like the, you know, the, that fluidity. And if I get it together, I'm going to blow a big hole in that wall. So actually, there's a kind of path of desire right through the space. And there's a linkage and a shortcut through the space right to that, that path, which is just walking that way. Because if I, if I might yeah, also, um, I was really interested when you were talking about the LA Museum and you know opening it up. And, and, and for example, there are places in Chicago, park districts and libraries that are you know, open spaces like that. But we hope and we envision that when you know there is the opportunity to have a, a cut through that we have this place that people kind of congregate and they cut through it or it's a safe place to loiter or to kind of you know just be um or it's a romantic weird path like you're in this nowheresville mm -hmm. and you're walking and you're like what's this like if i was younger i would go this is cool and you take a detour right. so it's all of that right um and I mean, especially too, and thinking about, um, again, I, I was really struck by the fact that there are so few places where, where people can be in the public or be in, in a public place. And I mean, even downtown, there's gorgeous buildings, but I, I think I would even be um, asked to leave if I hung around the rookery, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the atrium for all day long. I, the guy would ask me, what am I doing here and why am I, here so long and, and blah 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 and we're hoping to kind of re re kind of take that idea of a public space within a private building and allowing that public space to be activated through art or be activated you know through the bodies that are within that space it's funny because i think we've actually lost our ability to be in public space together yeah. mm -hmm. like i think Absolutely. we've we just don't know what to do with ourselves in public space. And when I see people in the commons, this is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. you know, right. They're sitting on their phone. They don't know how to reach their neighbor who's sitting right next to them. They don't know how to just start to engage in conversation. I don't know that we, we ever really were great at that as a public, <laughs> but it's getting well, worse and worse because there's but, so many other but, options But we also now. have a highly, a highly institutionalized, surveilled, and militarized yes. public yeah, space. Right. So it's no, I mean, I think it's beautiful to set up neighborhood parks and community spaces with, with good heart, but 
the you know our, our, our society itself is setting up you know you said like an architecture of desire which I think is you know a beautiful idea from situations international but our our our, our you know official culture is setting up just the opposite it's yes. you know it, it, they, they are public spaces of, of kind of you know like horror and control well it's uh, sorry interesting like as malls you know when do they start in the 60s or certainly the 70s became you know really alternate public spaces, but they quickly became privatized, right, for commerce, you know, for reasons that are understandable, but as that got worse, certainly over 25 years, we hope to kind of, you're right, because as truly public space is surveilled, and it's true, um, this is a private space, right, so in a way it can be a mall that we as private owners can choose to make it more public. Mm -hmm. So on a weird level, like, I feel like the, the flip side of that is a certain group of people that take the mall and make it really what it was. Like, you almost have to work the logic backwards. I don't think it's a complete um, end game. I think it's, it's, I think like a lot of these political moves, they're temporary. You have to kind of get an encampment, an encampment, and you gotta keep it moving. Because if it's moving that way, you're just trying to balance it or keep an option open. But you're right, uh, but space can remain open and remain public. But, you know, in, it's kind of like we're in a, man, a mannered moment because if you think of mannerism as an inversion of values and things become their opposite, it's weird. You're right, public has become private, part, partly because of the very technology that we all adopt and have engaged with on a daily level, these fetish devices. We've actually kind of further entrapped ourselves, especially in the last 10 years. So that's just what's happened. So how do we do it? So you need, you need something like that. Um, I, I like the commons. I, I think it works. Yeah. But I do understand, and that's part of what Matt and I, I think, uh, are uh, discussing, unless he's lying to me, is uh, <laughs> that it's kind of like also like the show transports and goes through the, the, the public streets and docks here. And we're trying to have an alternate, either further or a different experience of really John and Alana's book here and the various performers like Lindsay and a variety of other people. Well, you know, pursuant to putting this all together, we had some discussions about the recent Claire Bishop piece on The Shed in New York, um, mm -hmm. where she was posing the challenge that really the, the, the deeper question is the one of assembly and how you get people to talk to each other in that assembly space, you know, and she referenced libraries and other types of uh, knowledge resources, and I, and I think you know, so that becomes sort of a, that that question is like, who's allowed to assemble? What is the assembly piece right. of it? Well, and in, in Los Angeles right now, um, there is so much strife um, around art spaces as open spaces because of gentrification and also right. because yeah. of um, like class and race-based issues. So, um, you know, <laughs> you'll, there's a lot of art spaces that were like picketed, you know, and closed or, you know, blacklisted by certain activist organizations. And like, it was like, if you go there, then you like, you know, cross the line basically in, into the, like. I think there were threats on people's lives. There were threats on people's lives, yeah. the institutions or, or who? In art spaces in LA. Art spaces in LA. Um, and there's been like, um, so there's that. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's also. Um, we have a package here. Right. <laughs> there's also, um, you know, for the past maybe five to ten years, there's been like a huge effort to decolonize art spaces um, in Los Angeles um, that are very white. Yeah. And um, so there's a huge amount of. Um, just uh, uh, like a maelstrom <laughs> of um, emotions around even like even spaces like this or spaces like the commons um, and who are they for and who do they serve and um, and so on and I think that that's been really productive and unproductive um, at certain certain points um, but it's it's something that's 
like very much in the air and, and something that I heard from um, from some um, anti-gentrification activists was that they like specifically were targeting art spaces because they knew they could get publicity for their anti-gentrification right. wow. um, <laughs> wow. uh, you know um, struggles and so like there I mean it's it makes it very real, you know, just these issues of like <coughs> housing and affordable housing and poverty and um, racial strife. Um, and and it, it was very permeated. So like, I was just part of this event that happened in this big um, park that was opened next to this um, area called Chinatown. And um, Los Angeles, and it was this event that was um, open to the public, it was free, there was experimental performance happening, um, you know, it's like this big city park that just opened, and it opened because the community, like, really advocated for it, um, and, like, just protested and made it happen, um, and, like, right next <laughs> to, like, what I was doing, um, which had its own thing, was, like, this open mic where people were like shouting at each other, you know? Um, yep. And yeah. <laughs> like it was, and it was great that that the organizer of the event had like opened up a space for there to be an open mic and this shouting match. Um, I, and like, um, you know, I think that just the ability to have those spaces where people can like really disagree and can really, yeah. um, you know, and, and like people can come in that are, that do, f like I guess spaces that people feel safe enough or um, invited enough to be able to come in and, and talk about, um, you know, either like artistically or, um, or just like as an activist to be able to talk about their perspective um, is just like really crucial right now in, in Los Angeles. I don't know if you wanna talk yeah, about I mean, that I at think all. To talk about anything. Yeah, it's just like having some kind of public discussion it seems yeah. like really important. Yeah. Um, and I feel like, yeah, more and more, like, there's a lot of like, people that are in bubbles or like only talk to people that maybe have shared values. We're just fighting on Facebook. Yeah, we're just, yeah. Like, yeah. We're just gonna fight online. There's a lot of talking and yeah, not a lot of yeah. sort listening. of listening. Or, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's what we can do as cultural practitioners, though, is that we can provide some of those tools so that you can have dialogue and exchange. I mean, it's like food and microwaves. It's right. Like yeah. there are these very simple ways to provide a space where people do feel comfortable and are sort of taught, retaught. How to listen to one another? Yeah, that's you know, right. those, yeah. those. That's what we can add to this. I mean, lots of people can just talk. We need an inverse Twitter, <laughs> where it activates you and it makes you <laughs> listen to the message, like, and it puts you in a buzz or some zone where you actually have to listen to it. Because you're right, all the technologies just. You know what's great about this shouting match? At least you can only really shout at eleven people, like you know the old idea of a harangue. Right, was a stump speech, and you got up and you harangued the audience, which could be what, 40 or 50? It's whatever your voice could carry. Mm -hmm. So it was a certain kind of rhetorical speaking devices, but your audience was very limited. You get on a balcony and you're Mussolini, you can talk to maybe a thousand. But today, the, the, the simplest person can have 10,000 people, that, right? But I really like the fact that you had to put all that energy just to yell at maybe one guy or five people. It sounds bad because it's art, but it's actually a positive thing. Because you're just, you're really, it's a limited sphere and you're putting the energy into it. Like I, I worry about grassroots organization because unless you can reach 10,000 people, there's a why bother. Whereas even right. 20, 30 years ago, uh, grassroots organization was right, a bunch of fold-up chairs, some really bad coffee, and you had to get there at 9.30 at night. I, I was in a NYPER group, right, New York People's Interest Group, Ralph Nader's groups, and we had a New York and Illinois, different, just like your life brigade. But you would sit there with five people and you had to spend a couple hours and that's all you did. And you had to, com I think the sheer fact that you committed to that helped you through the hard times of getting your message built, to me. I'm so. just really interested in, I mean, in what everybody else is 
Yeah, that's my next move. I think yeah. we talk about <laughs> public engagement and listening. We, we should open it up for some questions. Um, we got about, what, I think, 15 minutes or so on the schedule here. So if uh, listening to us, some questions have occurred to any of you, feel free to pipe in now. Or just comments. Or sure. just comments yeah. or, yeah, anything. Or if you're freezing. <laughs> yeah. Anybody? I'm just wondering what yeah. the performance is going to be about. And like yeah. how it's going to be mixed uh -huh. together and whatnot. So. Well, this is, I think, you know, this conversation is sort of part of that. I mean, we're having this uh, moment that we see <laughs> we're talking about how the performances here and there were about this notion of writing instructions, right? Of so having a moment. You know, I always thought of uh, the difference between you know, being online and writing and uh, that thing that happens when you're confronting a blank page alone is that you're not worried about responses to what you're thinking or saying. You're sitting there allowing yourself to have the freedom to go wherever you want in your imagination. I, and I, so for me, that the instruction, the form of the instruction as a uh, written document, a uh, written choreography, uh, it has a sort of counter effect to that separation that I feel um, is engulfing us as a society. That atomization, and this is a notion that you can be out in the public and it's okay to interact with people. You have an excuse, you know? It, 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 I think that repairing the social bond idea, that, that comes back to me, the fact that we're getting out of the historical bond card now. So I think, you know, thinking about um, performance uh, and uh, dance in that way, for me, um, gives it this extra layer that can address some of these issues, ideally. Um, so, We'll have to hear what you think of them after you've seen it. Sure. Here, but, uh, I think that they're, they're very, yeah, Michelle. Oh, I just wanted to also add to what you were saying um, about, too, like I, when you were talking about like you're confronted with the page, yeah. and then um, reading the, some of the scores and, and then really trying to figure out, well, how am I going to approach this? Yeah. And there were clear instructions, but then everything is open to interpretation. Everything is open to a question. And um, Alana last night, she's like, oh, I love to see these things sort of come to life. And I was kind of, I was really happy that you said that because I was a little worried because the way we brought them to life included a lot of conversation about the fact that we're gonna interpret this this way. Maybe it says this on the page, but it could mean this and because my aesthetic sort of desires or uh, allegiances fall in a specific realm, I'm going to choose to put it in that realm. Um, and so that has been a real interesting kind of challenge um, to really be able to feel comfortable breaking it open and not, and, and not getting too wedded, although we were fairly at some points, but not getting too wedded to the, to the language. Because it is movement, and you know, I mean, if you're if you're a mover, then you know that there's a, a myriad of ways that you can do something with your body. Yeah, I think it's a very large number of layered mediums. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that's what's so great about tech scores is that it's like built into its DNA is like this aspect of the social, or the conversational, um, where you're either like having this imaginary conversation with the writer, or you're just like. Is this what you meant, or like, is is this yeah. what you meant, or like, you know, you're having a conversation with yourself, or if you're performing with somebody else, um, you're having this like really in depth conversation with the other performer or performers, and so um, just going back to like this inability to kind of talk to one another, like it really forces you to yeah. um, to 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 engage in like this really deep conversation, which is. But I think what's also interesting about it for me is that it, there's this background to it in this notion of dematerialization that, that, that there was a reaction against the art object mm -hmm. um, and the sort of corruptions of the art world or however you want to talk about that. But that there was then these evolutions and you know you saw the emergence of performance art as its own art form. You saw the emergence, the first instance of avant-garde dance coming out of so, you know, so these these moments that took place around that are informing the present of 
instruction. I always say instruction and interaction because you know, not all the instructions are interactions or direct toward interactions, but you want know, more of them to do. And I think that that interaction is medium and becomes pointed given all that history in the present. Um, you, know, you can have awkward conversation. I think that, that feeling of unease is something we've lost our ability to cope with, right? That we can feel awkward and it's okay. <laughs> um, you can get past it and you can go new places in your imagination and your experience. And so I think that's the idea there is that we're hoping to see some growth and expansion. Um, other questions? Yeah. I have one. Um, so I'm a composer and I have a kind of fraught relationship with scores and the yeah. inherent questions of power and consent when you're dealing with the fact that someone else's body is the channel through which your art is coming into being. Yeah, and so I was curious, of those of you who work with text scores or also even the light brigade work, how you have engaged with that question in your work. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. Can you, can you say that a different way? Yeah, I mean, just the fact that, like, um, I think I know you. When you're giving a score to someone, even if you're leaving uh, it open ended to a certain extent, their body is what is enacting your art and vision in some way or another. And for me, that brings up questions of, of power and consent. And yeah. I, I'm just curious, like, if, if, you know, how you all have been engaging. Yeah, that. I mean, I guess for me as a composer of the, the scores, I am always feel like very open and sometimes the things get performed in ways that are like exactly what I had expected and that's great and sometimes it's really different and um, in ways that could be positive or negative to me but that's not really, I don't, I, I personally give like full license to the performer I think to try to not indulge in that power. Um, I know other composers like we're working with somebody who's doing a performance where like you know where there's like the score might be just like one line but then there's like a whole a huge like secondary score that's really really important to them mm -hmm. and how it's actually that's not published. Yeah, that's not <laughs> that's not part of like the text. Um, and so like I mean they that power dynamic is really important to them. Um, I mean yeah, there's there's like a lot of different ways to approach it. Uh, Could, I, a, could I turn the question around and just ask you if it's all right? You know, you pick up a score, right? And uh, I don't know if it's John Cage or Ligeti or Beethoven or one of these. Um, you know, how do you feel like when all of a sudden you start to enact it, do you feel like that's giving yourself consent? It, like, and I say, obviously, you could say I am consenting too, but your question is phrased like outside in. So how does it work for you so that you're okay say, deciding to have agency and pr pursue something? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that's, I think that's a really good question. Um, I, I think I just, I, I think I struggle with it from the other end because, because um, I feel like I'm asking someone to do something. And, and you know, obviously if they're, if they're there for it, that's great and I feel wonderful about that. But just like the very act of like the asking in the first place like feels, feels But do you perform other people's music, I guess? Yeah, yeah, I do and, and, and for, that doesn't feel fraught to me because okay. because that's I know it's completely my own decision and I'm not involving anyone else in that mm. decision necessarily. And there is this history, it's like very powerful history of like composer, right. like right. you know, controlling exactly how the musician's interpreting and the, the musician's not even like has any agency about that. Right? We we dealt with that a lot with our very wonderful volunteers who will come out. I mean, a lot of times these are even when we're not involving authorities, it's it's like cold, it's windy. I mean, sometimes it's beautiful in the summer, but we'll go out. Mostly yeah. it's not. <laughs> we'll, we'll tell people to dress as if you're going ice fishing. That's a real Wisconsin thing. Um, but, but That's the default dress as I see. And I'm always really concerned about that. And and to the point where, for for me, like I have, I get a lot of anxiety about sounds really cool that I like fret about it and I fret during it and I fret that it, that someone's going to get hurt or get in trouble uh, when they don't want to. It's like one of the rules of civil disobedience is generally in these kinds of things 
you, you vet people, you say, are you willing to be arrested? And you say, no, I can't for whatever reason, but are you? Yes, you are, okay, you're in this group, you're in that group, and you, and you try to structure it. And and we, we have specific situations of you know, kind of differing levels of consent, and, and sometimes if someone is there and they're not comfortable holding the message, they just don't, and perhaps they leave, or perhaps they, sometimes we have more than one, and they stick around, and then the message that they're more in line with is the one that they'll participate in. Sometimes we'll have people who are very much eager to participate, but they can't be in photographs because of the job that they have. So that we're, they tell us, and we're very careful to be sure that they're not photographed. And, and we have done some work with um, immigrant communities and undocumented workers where their participation is something that they're willing to do, but every effort is made to make sure that if there's something that goes, you know, not quite according to plan, that there's there's a way that they can be safe. And, and that did actually happen um, one night. And, and these, these, these overpass spaces are really interesting because they're technically public. We choose ones that don't have cars on them because we, we just really don't want that extra added danger. But while they are public, they can't be blocked. And the jurisdiction of them is actually the sheriff's department because they cross over the highway. So, so the police have some jurisdiction, but it's really not, you know, they can deal with you on the sidewalk, but they can't really deal with you, you know, on this, on this overpass. And we've had to learn a lot about it, and it's been interesting. Um, so, so this particular message was about a strike at a local um, pizza manufactory that, that um, was actually calling immigration against its undocumented workers because they'd gone on strike. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of feeling about it in, in Milwaukee. So, so we went out and we called out the pizza company by name on the, on the overpass, and there were a lot of people there. There were um, people that were part of the immigrant rights organizations. There were some of the striking workers themselves. There was a, it was, it was, there were, I don't know, probably 50 people out. I mean, it was, it was a lot, you know, a lot of people crammed on a bridge. And then all of a sudden, we, we just started noticing that there was a Milwaukee police contingent sort of gathering at the beginning of the bridge. And usually when they have an issue with us, they'll just come right up and say, we've got an issue, we, you know, who do we talk to? And, and, and you know, we've got protocols for that. But they were just kind of hanging there. And, and we looked and there were bike cops and there was you know, one of those vans where they were ready to arrest people and put them in it. There was a SWAT team. There was, there was all dogs. kinds of dogs. They had the canine unit, they had it all. And they were just waiting. And they were waiting for the sheriff's department to come. And the minute the sheriff's department came, it, you know, just all hell broke loose. So, so, you know, all of us sort of like hapless middle-aged white ladies just sort of like went over to the sheriff's department and, and kind of diffused that rage over there while the immigrant rights group got everybody who wanted to get off the bridge, off the bridge. And, and it's, it's useful to have a group of volunteers who are primarily middle-aged and white because they're really good at just kind of diffusing the problems. So, so we just went over there, diffused the problems, and, and, and basically the rage was just, we'll give everybody a ticket. So they just went out and just ticketed all the cars, and, and that, was, that was their way to sort of pull but, off but, the anger. But this was very intense. It was incredibly the, intense. The, the immigrant community went off the other side of the bridge while, while we're dealing with enforcement. And that's where your question like mm -hmm. actually has consequences. It's just not a matter of like, oh, I feel so bad, assuming that you want to do my my will. Yeah. But like, you can get in serious shit for for, for, for for being here. So we try all that we can to do this. It was fascinating because the um, we have a lot of friends in the ACLU, and the next night we insisted to go back to the same place with the same message. And the uh, ACLU came out as witness, and then the, they um, and we uh, called the local news, and the local news came out. So they made a whole story about that crackdown. And after that, the police never bothered us again. And, and, and what was <laughs> interesting about it is the police did not want to be there. The, 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 the they, Milwaukee the, the, police. They did not want to be there. They had no problem with this. And it was obviously the sheriff's department that was that was calling the shots on this. Yeah. And then after the sheriff's department cleared off, the SWAT guy came up and gave us his card and said, you have every right to be out there. You should go right back out there. And if you ever have any trouble, 
call me. It's because complicated. It's really complicated. We, we, we did things down here. There was a Chicago Light Brigade for a while with some really hardcore activists. They're really great people. And there was a big union uh, teacher strike quite a you know, number of years back. Yeah. And we came down and, and, and did something. And the Chicago cops would come by and say, power to the union. Yeah. And they'd go on. And we're like, Chicago cops are notorious to be like, yeah. like rough. You know, and they're just, because they're all union people. Yeah. So, so it, it like depends on the message. It depends on the community. Anyway, that's uh, no, so it's, it's, a, it's a great, it's a great question. I mean, to, me, really to me, that question is like <clears throat> one of the ethical cores mm -hmm. um, and a really complex one. And uh, it's ethical because it actually has consequence on individuals, Absolutely. where the rest of it is like, you know, it's like bridge is public space, it's kind of a conceptual, cool mm -hmm. architectural thing, and you negotiate. But this stuff, like, people can get in real trouble. Well, I know everybody's been talking about Boris Shamatz's performance recently, in which dancers would be touching their genitals or they sort of touching members of the audience. And so it's a, there's a sort of lightning around that but in, in a larger societal way. But I'd love to get into that maybe next time. I think we're out of time though for this one. Everyone, there are performances that are coming ahead of us. So I think we'll just wrap it up right there. And uh, I want to thank all my panelists uh, and uh, Dave and Michelle, you know, John Bertel, Lane Hall, Anamon, Lisa Moline, Jenna Ray Perkos, Paula Fernal, and you, our audience and our viewers. Uh, thank you so much. Find us on Facebook at Movement Matters, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.